Okay, this is preaching to the choir here, but recitation is valuable. Um, recitation attendance has been low. Uh, recitation is important because the point is to solidify your key ideas and work on problem solving skills. <coughs> Talking with other students is actually really helpful uh, to do those things because when you're explaining something, you're solidifying your understanding or sometimes you're finding out that you didn't understand it as well as you thought you did and you have to retrench. Second, sometimes your ideas aren't quite right and you get feedback on that immediately on a one-on-one -on -one basis before you have to confront it on homework. So recitation is valuable. We know that recitation is required. <laughs> um, instructors give quizzes in recitation to make you come. I think recitation is too valuable to take up 10 minutes with a quiz because I think the time you spend working on problems is actually more important, so I'd prefer not to do that. So, so here's a new incentive. <coughs> um, so you know that there's a small amount of credit at the, at the end of the course for coming to class and participating. So you get a point for coming to lecture, you get a point for coming to recitation, right? Okay, starting now, you'll get a point for coming to lecture and a point for coming to recitation and that adds up to 100% of the points. But if you come to both lecture and recitation on one day, you'll get an extra point. So you could actually earn more than 100% of the points on the attendance component, which means that that's fine. That'll feed into your final grade if you have 100, you know, 130% on it. That's fine. We'll, we'll add it in. Okay? I'd just like you to come. <coughs> so, so, message. Recitation will save you time <coughs> on homework. <coughs> Second, uh, homework. <coughs> um, homework is where you really are struggle with ideas and learn to solve problems and learn physics. Um, I know that some people get 100% on homework who don't get 100% on tests. <coughs> and they're getting 100% on homework because they're getting the answers somewhere else. And yeah, I know you can do that, but that's really not in your interest. What's in your interest is to grapple with the problems and figure out how to do them. Do I expect you to get 100% on homework to get an A? Possibly not, okay? I think if you're getting <coughs> most of it, I think it's, un it's, it's very unusual for anyone really to get 100% if they're actually really working all the problems themselves. Um, you know, so if you're up there at 80% or something like that, that's great. So, um, but if you're just looking up answers online, you're depriving yourself which is possibly not in your best interests. Okay, end of sermons for today. Questions? <coughs> All right. Um, today we're going to something new, and in, in this chapter uh, we're going to talk about circuits because we're using circuits to make magnetic fields. We're wiring up wires to batteries and making light bulbs light, and uh, it would be in our interest to understand more about how they work. This is an unusual chapter. We want to, and we want to understand circuits in terms of the concepts we already know. So we want to understand them in terms of charge and electric field and energy. Uh, so we're going to take a microscopic view of what happens in circuits. Uh, your friends and roommates probably have not heard this in their intro physics classes because it's not typically done. But this is really the fundamental stuff of what's really going on inside of circuits. Um, <coughs> There's going to be a lot of, uh, it's going to be less mathematical and more qualitative uh, throughout part of this chapter. And, but the qualitative reasoning is actually important. So, informal reasoning that doesn't use mathematics, but it's still formal. That's, that's what we're doing today. <coughs> um, and so, what we're going to do today is talk about what's happening in circuits. <coughs> and we're going to answer questions like, uh, are you getting something for nothing when you, light, you wire up a circuit and a light bulb lights, or is something used up in a circuit? And if so, what's used up in the circuit? Um, how 
can we actually, <coughs> we've talked about current flowing in circuits, which means electrons are moving, um, <coughs> which means that the circuit isn't at equilibrium. So how on earth do we keep that going? How do we make an electric field that keeps a circuit going? <coughs> and what's the battery do? What's the point of the battery? What's the function of the battery or the power supply in a circuit? So there are a lot of sort of pretty deep questions that, are, that give us a chance to apply the ideas we've developed up to now in a new context, in a different context. So the first thing we, um, to note about circuits is that a circuit is not at equilibrium. Remember that we said at equilibrium, in a conductor, uh, the, the average drift speed was zero. And so electron motion might have, electrons are still moving, but they're moving completely randomly and there's no collective motion in any particular direction. And we did mention the word steady state <coughs> a circuit that's running and the current isn't changing is in what we call a steady state it means that the drift speed average drift speed of electrons in the circuit is some constant <coughs> that's greater than zero um, and uh, and it's not so it's not changing so charges keep moving in the same direction at the same speed it's not changing and the question and then there's in between there's some kind of like how do you get to either equilibrium or steady state and in a transient things are changing uh, drift speeds change charges pile up whatever we talked about that when we talked about polarizing a conductor <coughs> So let's think about, uh, so the first thing we want to think about is uh, think about current and charge flow in a simple circuit like the ones you've made in lab. So here is a simple circuit. It's got a battery, a couple wires, and a light bulb, <coughs> and the light bulb's lit. So this is a steady state circuit. <coughs> um, <coughs> as you might expect, the battery has ends labeled plus and minus. The negative end is the one where electrons come out and the positive end is where the electrons go in. And then there's some <coughs> redox reactions inside the battery that, that consume the electrons here and generate new ones here and charges diffuse around to keep it from charge from piling up. Um, <coughs> So our question is, we're, we've marked two points in the middle of wires, A and B. And our, the first question is, what's the direction electrons are traveling when they reach point A? Yeah. <coughs> uh, <laughs> okay, so why is an anion called an anion? Because well, it, know, but it. I know that the anion or the cation go to the cathode and the anion go to the anion. Right, and cations are positive, so if they if they want to go to so so that would make that the cathode, right? And that would make that the anode, because okay. anode, um, that's why they're called that, okay. yeah. <coughs> so, <coughs> so anyway, what's the direction? Can we see some numbers? Three or four, okay. So if the electrons, most of you said four, and since the wire is slanting this way, 
that's probably right because if the electrons were going that way they just hit the edge of the wire and pile up there <coughs> so electrons are flowing through the wire they have to follow the wire and one of the interesting things about circuits is no matter how you bend the wire the electrons seem to be able to follow the wire which is something that we'll be able to explain um, so so are you comfortable with electrons with four being the right answer and electrons direction at that location okay and so what direction are electrons going at uh, when they get to B Six. yeah well, so they're following the wire, right? So six, yep, yep. So electrons are generated here, they come out here, they go around here, and they get used up in chemical reactions there in the battery. <coughs> okay. So now the question is about current, though. And remember that we defined electron current, which is lowercase i, as the number of electrons per second passing a point in a conductor. Okay, so I is the number of electrons per second passing this location versus passing that location, which is on the other side of the light bulb. So the question is, how do those two electron currents, uh, is A greater than B, is A equal to B, is A less than B, what's What's up here? Take a second and think about it. So what do you think? What do you think? Okay, I see votes for one, I see votes for two, I don't actually see any four. Okay. <laughs> we'll discount four. <laughs> Wait, I'm asking you to guess, Caden. So, so it's, okay, all right, so, so I mean, you, 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 you think about it and you take your best, okay, so I see ones and twos, so let's, let's talk about, nobody somehow thinks that there's more electrons passing that point than that point, and indeed there is a light bulb in the way, so let's, let's talk about, let's talk about possibility one, okay, let's talk about the idea that more electrons per second pass point A than pass point B. So if we have 3 times 10 to the 18th electrons per second going through location A, we might have only 1.5 times 10 to the 18th electrons going through location B, for example. What happened to the other electrons? Well, no, I'm not asking you to, to say other words. I'm saying let's, let's, we're thinking at a level where you probably haven't thought before about this circuit. So where we have three times, in one second, three times 10 to the minus 18, 10 to the plus 18th electrons go through here. But only 1.5 times 10 to the 18th electrons go through here. So what happened to the other 1.5 times 10 to the 18th elect? That's a lot of electrons. Okay, they're stuck in the light bulb, right? I mean, they can't, they can't just vanish, right? You can't destroy charge. So that would violate conservation of charge. So you'd actually have to have something like a positron annihilate them. And I think we'd know if we had antimatter lurking in light bulbs. Um, that would be fairly spectacular. So that's probably not happening. So they would get stuck in the light bulb, wouldn't they? Okay, so let's say we've got a lot of electrons stuck in this light bulb. What happens to the electrons coming this way now? All of a sudden the light bulb is really negative, right? Yeah, they're gonna be repelled. Seems like the current would just stop. Yeah. So, so that we get a really big negative charge. Also, we might even notice that uh, the light bulb had a really large negative charge. Yes? Wait, what? On what? 
So would it, like, what's it called? They have a like, like positive area so that the like, electrons float to be? The electrons can't, how are they going to flow to B? No, so, from the light bulb. No. Now, the inside of a conductor is neutral. The okay, so, so let's, let's pick up on Robert's idea and say, here are all these electrons that are piled up here repelling each other. Where might they go? Well, they might flow out that way. <laughs> so... So the idea of electrons just piling up in the light bulb until, and does A, it suggests the current would just stop flowing because these electrons would be repelled. B, to get away from each other, these electrons would probably want to go that way. So, so, so when we think about the mechanics of this, I mean, it does seem like something happens in that light bulb, right? We're getting all this light out and we're getting heat out, <coughs> okay? But to have electrons pile up there probably isn't a sustainable thing. <clears throat> so it seems plausible that in the steady state, and steady state means the drift speed is the same everywhere as long as the wires are the same here. So seems like in the steady state we would have to have the same number of electrons passing location A as we have passing location B. Because uh, we get into some, some, some serious problems if we don't have that. Well, if that's the case, if electrons aren't piling up in the light bulb and they're not destroyed in the light bulb, what is getting used up in the light bulb? has to be energy. It has to be energy. That's right. So what's happening is that some of the energy, the kinetic energy of the electrons <coughs> is being transferred. Yeah, and so how is that working? Well, we know that, that our, our metal is made of a lattice of, of atoms, which we're now this semester seeing as positive atomic cores bonded together by covalent bonds, and each one has given up one electron to the mobile electron C, which can move through the whole wire. <coughs> well, these mobile electrons can collide with this lattice and just give up some of their energy to the lattice. What happens when it does that? Well, the, the atoms vibrate more, okay? We have this vibrational excitation we talked about last semester. <coughs> Okay, so now our metal atoms are in an excited vibrational state. And how can they come back down to the ground state? They can emit radiation, right? They can give up photons, which is the light you're seeing. So that, it starts to make sense. So the vis there's visible and there's also the infrared that you can detect by feeling how hot it is. So that's photons in the infrared that we can't see with our eyes, but we can detect with our skin. So, so it sort of all hangs together. Um, the electrons, we're not using up electrons, we're not piling up electrons because they would repel other electrons, but some of their energy in there is converted to radi radiation, which we can detect in various ways. <coughs> okay. Um, now some people say, that, so other comments about this, because this is a key idea. Okay, yeah. So very briefly, it just loses all of it. And after exiting the light bulb, it's pretty much stable back to steady state. Well, what has to happen is that we talked about early on the, the Druda model for charge motion in, in, a, in a conductor, in a metal. And remember we talked about the fact that if you've got a non-zero electric field inside this, it can accelerate the electrons till they collide with the lattice, lose energy, but then if the electric field is still there, it accelerates them again and they collide and lose energy. And so what has to happen is 
somehow we've got, and we don't know how yet, it's mysterious, but there's a big enough electric field in this tiny thin filament in the light bulb. And if you look at the light bulb carefully in lab, you'll see that, that inside this old style light bulb, which we may not have around very long, um, there's a very, very thin coiled metal wire. It's made of tungsten. Um, and, uh, and so that's, the electrons all have to go through that. And it's very narrow, which means that, um, <coughs> well, as we see, they're going to have to actually go fairly fast to get through it. And they, they're colliding with that and it exciting the vibrations of the atoms in the lattice and, and they're giving off infrared and visible radiation. <coughs> um, but somehow there has to be an electric field in a big, kind of a big electric field in that light bulb. And so that's one of the mysteries that we're going <coughs> to going to talk about. Now, why do I say there has to be an electric field inside that light bulb? Can't the electrons just push each other through the wire? So some people talk about, in fact, you'll even see it in some descriptions, you know, electrons are like peas in a tube and they, they push each other through the wire. That's, that doesn't hang together because that's not what the inside of the metal looks like. <clears throat> so in our more sophisticated view, we've got all these positive atomic cores, and then we've got <clears throat> some moving electrons. So here's an electron that might, it's certainly, this electron certainly makes a field that's going to push that electron that way. But then there's this electron over here which makes a field that's going to push it this way, plus there are these positive cores attracting it. The inside of the conductor is neutral. <clears throat> so the net result is that we need an electric field made by something else to push these electrons through the wire. And right now that's just a puzzle. We don't know where it comes from and that's, our, that's going to be one of our goals. <clears throat> so, um, so we can codify this result. Uh, it gets codified as what is called, uh, in fancy language, the current node rule. <coughs> What's a node? Well, a node is, is some sort of junction of one or more wires, but you can define you can define A and B as nodes here because you can talk about A as the junction of <coughs> this piece of wire coming into there and that piece of wire going out of there. So a node is what you make it. <coughs> but in general, if you have several current carrying things coming out here and you have <coughs> some electron current I1, and some electron current I2 coming in, then some electrode current I3 going out, um, I1 plus I2 has to equal I3. No electrons get left here. So the, the number of electrons per second going in has to be the same as the number of electrons per second going out, just to avoid having electrons pile up anywhere. And more officially, we can write the sum of the currents into a node is equal to the sum coming out of a node. <coughs> now, this sounds like some important rule, and it's a use. But only in the steady state. In the state, yes, but I was just going to say. <laughs> um, it sounds like something new, but it's not really. It's just our definition of the steady state, which is that uh, current flows aren't changing, and the principle of conservation of charge, which says that we can't be destroying or creating charges. So really, this is, this is just <coughs> definition of steady state plus conservation 
conservation of charge. <coughs> And so applying our node rule to this, this circuit <coughs> says that if we define the light bulb as a node, then the number of electrons per second coming in has to equal the number of electrons per second going out. Okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> Okay, so in this circuit, which is schematically shows there's no light bulb, but there's a thick wire going into a thinner Okay, so what's the answer here? Okay, if you're confused, ask a question. Okay, the answer is two. Um, because our definition of steady state says electrons can't be piling up here, so the number of electrons per second coming out of the battery and going through this wire has to be equal to the number of electrons per second going back into the battery on the other side. Okay, if you're looking puzzled, you might be thinking, how can this work? <laughs> yeah, okay. So let's talk about how it could work. <coughs> and for this, we will go back to our equation for electron current, um, which the number of electrons per second was equal, we derived this, to the density of mobile electrons, the number of mobile electrons per cubic meter, times the cross-sectional area of the conductor, times the average drift speed. Okay, so let's actually just write uh, I1 equals I2, so, and let's say these wires are made of the same material, so N is, N is the same, the density of mobile electrons, the number of mobile electrons per cubic meter is the same for each one, so N, A1, V1 is going to have to be equal to N, <coughs> A2, V2. <coughs> well, it seems really clear that, that A1 is bigger than A2 because it's a, it's, this wire has a much bigger diameter, right? <coughs> so, the ends are the same. So if we just rearrange this a little, Right? <coughs> so the speeds have to be different. The drift speeds have to be different. Okay? The electrons have to be going faster in this thin wire and slower in the thick wire so that we get the same number per second. <coughs> and so this, so V1 should be less than V2, is that right? Well, A2 is smaller than A1, so this number is less than 1. <coughs> so, so if that was, if the ratio of the cross-sectional areas was 2, so if <coughs> A2 equals a half A1, we'd have V1 equals, um, Half V2, yeah? Yeah, Jonathan. So, when it's steady state, the net electric field has to be the same, right? No, we didn't say that. No. The steady state, and that's a very good question, and it's what we're getting to. So, let's take the next step, because that's a really good question. Does the net electric field have to be the same in these two wires? <coughs> Well, remember that our drift speed <coughs> is defined as the mobility of the electrons in the material times the magnitude of the electric field in the material. And since we've def we said these wires are made of the same material, the mobility is going to be the same. 
So that suggests that um, if, so we can write UE1 for our drift speed in wire 1 and UE2 for the drift speed in our wire 2 and these are the same so we we deduce here that the electric field in wire 1 is actually going to be half as large in magnitude as the electric field in wire 2 because what has to be the same is the number of electrons per second because otherwise they're going to pile up somewhere. So that has to be the case. We've just we've deduced this that this has to be the case. But how on earth can we possibly arrange this? Okay, how is the circuit going to be smart enough to figure out how to make an electric field? We don't even know where the charges are that make the electric field in the circuit. And but we're saying that if the thickness of the wires is different. It has to actually make two different electric fields. So how is this possibly going to work out? And that's what we need to, to work through today. <coughs> um, furthermore, there's some, there's some things that we uh, <coughs> true. For example, we agree that the electrons are moving through the wire, right? And if the electrons are moving in the direction of the electric field at their location, that must mean the electric field has to follow the wires. So up here, the electric field's got to point that way. And over here, though, it better point that way. And at the corner, it better point that way. <laughs> so we have some other puzzles that we need, we need to solve um, to figure out what's going on here. So, our goal is <coughs> to decide, um, to figure out, to deduce where, how, th how we can make these electric fields, or how a circuit can make these electric fields, how that can get set up, and what we're going to do about it. So, um, okay. So I have a handout for you, and this handout is for you to draw on, and a picture like this. In fact, it's got four of them, two on the front and two on the back, and the goal is on the front, uh, I'll pose some questions and you're just going to think through them and, and make your best effort at reasoning what it's got to be and draw that. Um, and then we'll talk about our, you know, we'll talk together about our conclusions and you may want to revise your, your, your drawings by what? We need two more for I, I thought I gave you four. You gave us two. Really? Okay. <laughs> okay, I can't count. Um, so, and so, so, so the idea of this is it should free you up to actually do some thinking and guessing on the front the right answers on so you don't have to just sit there and wait for me to tell you the right answer and write it down on your paper you can actually um, you can actually work things out okay <coughs> So the first question is going to be, so what is, what is this picture, okay? What this picture is, is a circuit. Um, and so there's a wire that's a very bendy wire, but it has uniform cross-sectional area. And there's a battery. And what we've done in this diagram is to replace our chemical battery which is complicated with a really simple battery that's a mechanical battery that we can imagine making. It's like a Van de Graaff generator. So we turn a crank 
brushes brush something. We have a little conveyor belt that takes electrons from here to there and it's basically got a capacitor here on the ends of it. So positive charge on one side. We actually do some work to take electrons off the positive side and put them on the negative side. So that's our mechanical battery so we don't have to worry about chemical reactions uh, when we're thinking about this circuit. But the basic thing it's doing is it's just maintaining a constant charge on the two plates of this capacitor. Okay, so our capacitor, the plates of the capacitor are like the ends of the batteries you use in lab. Um, one's positive and one's negative. <coughs> okay, so what, let's say this circuit is in the steady state. And what I want you to do is, in the steady state, given that the wire is of uniform thickness, even though it's strange and snaky, I want you to draw at the, little, at the, at the numbered locations draw the, uh, an arrow representing the drift what the drift velocity of electrons must be at that location. Okay, given that the circuit is in a steady state. So what we're doing is we're thinking about what this, what this really ought to look like in the end. Not how it happens right now, but just what it should look like. Okay, so take a second and do that. And don't be afraid to draw because you've got the back to, to do corrections on. <coughs> so do your arrows look like this? Okay, so electrons are going to flow away from this negative plate, right? Yep. And then they're going to follow the wire. So they've got to be going in the direction. And since the electron current has to be the same everywhere in the steady state, the drift speed has to be the same because the area, the cross-sectional area of the wire doesn't change here. Does that make sense? Okay, questions about that. Okay, so given that, and given that the drift speed is directly proportional to the magnitude of the electric field at the particular location it's measured, draw on the one, on the one you're, you're guessing on, okay, draw the, uh, at each of these locations what the electric field inside the wire at that location needs to be to produce this pattern of, of drift velocities, okay? Um, still on the top. <coughs> the top diagram is, is the top, so the idea is the top diagram is going to be um, our representation of what we think it really ought to look like in the steady state. Okay, so we're just sort of deducing from our definition of steady state what this pattern has to be okay, in the steady state. The bottom diagram we're going to save for working out how we get there. <coughs> okay, do you need a minute? You good? All right. So So, does your diagram kind of look like this? Yes. Awesome. So, because they're electrons, to get the electron to go this way, we have to have a field going that way. And because we need the drift speed to be constant everywhere, then the magnitude of the electric field has to be the same everywhere. And because the electrons have to follow the wire, the electric field has to follow the wire also. So questions about how it needs to look in the steady state. I think this diagram is actually in the book also, so. Right. So this is how it should look. But let's think, let's try to figure out, and, and, and so any questions about how it should look in the steady state? So let's try to figure out how we get to that point though. How do we make, that's a weird pattern of electric field. 
we do not, we know lots of things that make interesting patterns of electric field, but we sure don't know anything that makes a pattern of electric field that looks <coughs> quite like that. <coughs> so how did we make that? <coughs> okay, so bottom diagram. <coughs> um, <coughs> Assume for a minute, you can imagine that the, the wire isn't even there yet. We're going to put the wire there later. <clears throat> but these locations are there. Let's just draw the, the electric field <clears throat> at all of these locations due only to the charges on our mechanical battery, <clears throat> which some of you pointed out uh, a while ago looks kind of dipole y. <clears throat> Okay, so if those charges were the only ones in the universe, what electric fields would they make at these numbered locations? So draw the direction of the electric field they'd make and also make them make the magnitude, relative magnitudes correct, like if the field's bigger somewhere, make a longer arrow. <coughs> okay, we got some arrows. <coughs> So does your pattern of field due to these charges look kind of like that? Yeah. Yeah, well, I just, I offset this. I mean, it's fine to draw through things. That's absolutely fine. I, I offset these arrows, but it would be better to put them where they belong. Okay, so... So it really is a lot like a dipole field. We have the big field to the left here and a big field to the left there. Down here, the field is actually going the other direction and it falls off with distance. So this is like the field on the dipole axis and this is like the field on the perpendicular axis. Okay, but those are the only charges we know about. If those were the things driving the current, what would the electron drift velocities look like at these locations? So given, given these, this pattern of field, given the field at each of these locations, what would the drift velocity of an electron at that location be? So draw arrows representing of an electron at each location due to that pattern of field. Okay, it is not going to look like what you drew in the previous diagram of how it's supposed to be. Okay, we got arrows. No, we're not talking about what it's like in the steady state. We're talking about what this would do. So we got out of our systems what it has to look like in the steady state. Now, uh, now all we're doing is talking about what this pattern of field would do. <coughs> so <coughs> presumably we would get a pattern of drift speeds, uh, drift velocities that look kind of like this, where a big field means a big drift f speed and a smaller field. And <coughs> so is this a steady state situation? No. It's definitely not, is it? Um, so first of all, the drift speeds aren't all the same. But even more disturbingly, although the electrons are going in an appropriate direction here, at this location, they're going the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we are not yet at a steady state. But we are in a situation where interesting can happen. And so, let's think about, um, what is, let's focus on, uh, let's focus on, we're going to call this, the right bend in the wire and we're going to call this the left bend in the wire 
Um, and let's focus for a minute on the left bend in the wire. Let's think about what's going to happen in the next fraction of a second here. We've got electrons flowing this way and we've got electrons flowing that way. What's going to happen? Yeah, we're going to have electrons piling up here, aren't we? It's going to get negative. We've got, we've got electrons flowing in here and negative charges flowing in here. What happens here? It gets positive, doesn't it? Because we have electrons flowing out. Flowing out, we're going to have a deficiency of negative charge. So in the next fraction of a second, the left bend is actually going to end up becoming somewhat negative and the right bend is actually going to end up becoming somewhat positive. <coughs> now, we're talking about a conductor. We're talking about excess charge in a conductor. Where does excess charge end up on a conductor? Inside, on the surface, on the surface, right? So what's going to happen in the next fraction of a second is we are going to build up um, <coughs> just focusing on these bends, you're going to build up some positive charge on the surface here and some negative charge excess electrons on the surface here. Now we've got a new source of electric field. Because in addition to the field made by our battery here, these charges produce a little bit of field going that way and these charges produce a little bit of field going that way. And so the net field at this location is now the sum of the field due to the battery and the sum of the fields due to the charges that have just piled up on the surface of the wire. And so the net field is going to end up being the sum of these two, so it's going to still be in the wrong direction, but it's going to be a little bit smaller. <coughs> so we'll let it go for another fraction of a second. And more charge piles up here, and more charge piles up here, and this arrow gets bigger. And it keeps going until, can you see what's gonna happen? Until it's in the right direction and has the right magnitude. This is called feedback, okay? So things are gonna pile up. Electrons are gonna pile up on the left, and there's gonna be a deficiency on the right, and <coughs> So when we get to that point, which isn't going to take very long, we probably end up with something that looks kind of like this. And you're not going to be able to copy this diagram, but it is in the textbook. Um, <coughs> so we've got charges all over the surface of the wire that are contributing to the net field inside the wire everywhere. And it's complicated. But basically, what we're going to see is there's kind of a lot of charge, negative charge here. Um, there's some negative charge at this bend. There's a little bit negative charge here. And eventually, we start to get positive charge, more positive, more positive, more positive, until we back to there. <coughs> at which point, we've got the right pattern of electric field. And we've got, we've got the right pattern of drift drift velocities, and, and the net field at any location is due to two contributions. One is the battery, and the other is the charge on the surface of the wire. Yeah, Hendrik. So, um, if eventually after it you know, stabilizes to look like the initial one that we had, will we assume the drift velocity? Well, if you just ignore all these charges and just kind of look at the pattern of, of field and drift velocity, you'll see that it does look like the initial pattern. So we get to that pattern. You knew it had to get to. So will it stabilize or will it shift back? It, it does. It does. This all happens very quickly. Why does it happen so quickly? Because there are a lot of electrons at any given location. And so electrons can easily sh shift uh, an eight, one to the 10 to the minus 18th meters, you know, to the surface or travel in 10 to the minus 18th meters. They're not traveling very far. Um, and so, 
So it's very quick, and you've seen this, right? Because you made, you made circuits with a light bulb, right? And the light bulb was lit. And then I'm sure you bent the wires and moved the light bulb. Well, the light bulb didn't go out, even though the shape of the wires had changed, which means that this rearrangement of surface charge is really fast, um, attoseconds, to, to keep the steady state going. So it, it's dynamic in the sense that if you perturb it, it'll, it'll shift very fast and get back to the same, to whatever it has to do to make this pattern of drift speeds the same. Because that's the only case situation in which we're not going to have electrons piling up. Jonathan, did you have a question too? Uh, sort of like, how do you predict that? Like, how do you predict how the surface charges are going to pile up? Okay, so how do you predict where the surface charges are really going to be? Um, so, quantitatively, it's not trivial. <laughs> uh, so, um, we can say, <coughs> qualitatively, we could say, well, if we, have, <coughs> if we have our battery here, let's make it negative on the same side, and we just had <coughs> a circular wire, <coughs> we're probably going to have kind of a lot of negative charge here and a lot of positive charge here. <coughs> And maybe a little bit less positive here, a little bit less negative here, and something. So we're going to get a gradient, a spatial variation in charge that's fairly smooth. And we'll see in a few minutes, yeah, we'll see in a few minutes that, um, that it's the gradient. It's the rate of change of the charge, not the absolute amount of charge that's responsible for this. Now. <coughs> We can calculate it. Um, uh, so, glow script. Um, <coughs> but it's not a. It's not a simple process. So this is a <coughs> So this is a result of a computer program that we wrote to calculate the distribution of surface charge in a steady state circuit that looks like it's a lot this is a lot simpler than the snaky circuit we just looked at so it's just here's our capacitor with our mechanical battery and then it's just a long wire that's in the shape of a rectangle. The cross-section of the wire is square because it's much easier to do the calculations that way. But it shouldn't matter if your wires are square or round. You should get this. And so to do, to do the actual calculations about the surface charge distribution um, is, is slow because a little discussion in the textbook of how that's done. It's basically a relaxation calculation. You start you start with all the charge here the way we did. and You basically do what we did in, in thinking about it. You start with all the charge here and you say, what would the fields be at every other point on the circuit? So you divide the surface of the, the circuit into little teeny squares or cubes and look at that. And then, so what would happen to electrons there? Okay, we've moved all those. Now let's look at the fields there. Okay, now what's going to happen? And we go through exactly the same reasoning process we did in until we get to a state where the fields aren't, in, aren't changing. <clears throat> and that's done offline. And in fact, since it's sort of a parallel calculation, we actually used uh, GPUs, the graphics cards, to do some of the calculations to speed it up. <clears throat> um, what's done here is that once we've got that charge distribution, which is what we just loaded, this program, which is a vPython program, can in real time calculate the fields everywhere. So if we, and what it's doing is calculating the field inside the wire, but it's making the arrow on the surface just so we can see it. So if I drag around, you can see that orange arrow is the electric field at the location of wherever the tail is. And you can see that as I drag it around this circuit, as long as I, my hand is steady enough that I don't go outside the wire, 
wire, it's pretty uniform and it follows the wire. In fact, it, whoops, I got outside, okay? Now, how much of that is due to the, the battery and how much is due to the surface charge? Oh, and positive, red is positive charge and blue is negative charge. And we see that you end up with a tremendous amount of positive charge on the top here and a lot of negative charge. And then down at the bottom, it's super, super pale. And in fact, in the middle, there is zero charge because it's a symmetric circuit. <coughs> um, so the intensity of the color reflects the amount of charge. And we can see that if we just look at the, the uh, field due to the battery, which is this magenta wire, magenta arrow, we see down here the field due to the battery is almost zero. Um, and up here it's bigger. If we look at just the field due to surface charges, um, we get a green arrow. Okay, that's super big there, and then by now it looks exactly like the net field did because that's most of it. And if we show everything together just so we can see the superposition going on, we see that the net field, let me zoom out so you can see. Okay, the field due to the battery is really big, and the field due to the surface charges here counteracts it enough to get the net field we know we need. Here it's a lot smaller. And here the net field and the field due to the surface charges is really about the same. Okay. And this is a, this is a demo program that's available at glowscript.org so you can mess with it um, and, and try it out for yourself. We also can look at our super sneaky circuit um, and do the same thing here. And it's, you can see it's super complicated, right, in this circuit so that there's and there's even little puddles of the wrong sign of charge here at some of the corners where uh, but if you look at the interesting thing is that in either case if you look at a graph of um, let's go back to our tall circuit if we look at a graph of uh, surface charge density versus position on the wire so here's, a, here's one plate of the battery, here's the other. And these are corners. Corners are a pain. You can't, it's hard to think about corners. But you can see that we have a pretty smooth gradient of charge along that circuit. <coughs> so we, uh, we deduced, just by thinking about what had to happen, that there has to be charge on the surface of wires in a circuit to make the to help contribute to the electric field that drives the current in the circuit that it isn't all charge on the battery um, and our so we were doing qualitative reasoning but we came to a, a valid conclusion now I don't have probably don't have time to do it today we have a you can do an experiment that actually shows uh, that lets you detect surface charge on, on wires in a circuit. Why don't you know it's there when you're building these little circuits? Because these wires are such good conductors that you need teeny electric fields and so the amount of charge on the wires is actually really small. But if you use really bad conductors you can get a lot of... Uh, so I can show you uh, either this time or next time a video of an experiment where we use a 10 kilovolt power supply and some really macho resistors and you can actually you do electrostatic detection of surface charge. Yes? So, the electric field on wires is kind of due to these charges building up. Do you affect that surface charge when you touch the wire itself and like around it? Um, so the question is the electric field on on wires is due to surface charges building touch the wire would you affect the charge? The answer is a little bit. I mean so uh, now most of those wires you're using are insulated so in fact you're not touching the wires very much um, but 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 sure there's going to be some polarization and whatnot but the battery is going to have to keep up by sending out charges to make a surface charge distribution that works. Um, in the experiment that I'm talking about which with the very high voltage circuit, 
uh, the wires are naked wires, so we can touch it with a charged object, but you would not want to charge it with your fingers. <laughs> you would not want to touch it with your fingers in that situation. Uh, the person doing it has one hand behind their back. <laughs> so it's, um, so, um, okay. So, So we've deduced um, that uh, we deduced that there has to be charge on the surface of these wires, and the reason you don't know about it and you don't ever notice it in ordinary life is that it's small because the fields aren't very big, um, but it is there, uh, and the fi net field in the wires some of the is the sum of fields due to two things. One is absolutely the, the charges on the battery. But the other is this other charge spread around the surface of the wire. Now we saw um, in uh, we saw in the, the thin circuit that um, <coughs> Then when we went down to the bottom bar, the battery was getting almost nothing and the, the, the uniform electric field was caused almost entirely by surface charges. <coughs> so how does that work? So here's a little vPython program that just has a whole bunch of charged rings. <coughs> so a bunch of rings of charge. And again, red is positive, blue is negative, and the intensity of the color is the amount of charge. So long about Along about here, we've got a neutral. So this is very positive, a little bit less positive, less positive, neutral, starting to get negative. Okay. And in this calculation, um, I've approximated each of these rings by a set of point charges, which you can see as as little bumps on the surface of the ring. So every ring is approximated by, I don't know, looks like maybe couple, maybe 20 point charges, something like that. And all this program is going to do is going to do what you did when you calculated the electric field of a rod, which is it's going to add up the contributions of each charge at some observation location and just plot the result. And where we're going to plot, where we, so this, this is a model of <coughs> surface charge on the outside of a conducting wire, because the inside is neutral. But we could have a gradient of surface charge on the outside where we had a lot of charge, a lot of positive charge, less positive charge, no charge, starting to get negative charge on the outside of the wire. And the question is, what kind of field would that make? Now it's obviously a continuous distribution, but what we're doing is approximating this continuous distribution with discrete rings so we can just do the calculation. Um, now you'd think this wouldn't do a very good job because the rings are pretty far apart and I'm not using that many point charges to approximate each ring. But in fact what you see if you look in the inside of the wire here is that you get just from these charges a remarkably uniform field. It's not only uniform along the, along the wire but it's uniform along the, the cross section of the wire. So that's where the observation locations are. Um, so we're getting a, a really remarkably uniform field filling the wire just by having a set of charged rings. This is a program you could write. Okay, so you could do this calculation. Now, we can look at the field elsewhere. Of course, there is a field outside due to these charges. Um, but we don't care about it because there aren't any mobile electrons there. <laughs> And is it as good over here? No. It's probably even pointing the wrong way, but that's, that, would, that would just be the end of a wire. So we're just taking a segment of wire in the middle of the circuit here to look at this. So, so this kind of a, a gradient, a spatial variation of surface charge, will indeed produce the kind of field we actually need um, to fill the wire. Now it's interesting to think about whether we can actually prove that the field has to be 
uh, uniform not only <coughs> not only along the length of the wire but also across the cross section of the wire. <coughs> so could it be that here's a section of wire that we have um, a big electric field here and a smaller electric field here and sort of something intermediate here so so And the reason we, we can show that we can't do this, that this won't work, do you see how we can prove that? <coughs> Back to potential. Suppose we take a round trip that starts, so we're going to take a path that starts at this location and it's going to go like this and like that and like that and like that okay so we're going to consider that as our round trip path <coughs> so what is if we calculate the potential difference along this path what does it have to add up to zero, zero. it's got to be zero let's see if it does on the top <coughs> so we'll call this e1 on the top and e2 on the bottom on the top we have we're going this way so we have a minus E1 times L, where L is the length of our top of our path. So let's call that L. We'll call this H. <coughs> On the right hand side, <coughs> we have our path going this way, but the electric field is going that way. So we're going to get zero for the right. On the bottom, <coughs> we have we're going against the field, so we have a plus E2 times L. Oh, that was the left side, sorry. On the right side, we have another zero because E is perpendicular to VL. So delta V <coughs> round trip is equal to minus E1 L plus E2 L. And the only way for that to be zero is if E1 equals E2. So, so that can't be, we, the field has to be uniform across the wire, which is what we saw um, in that calculation with the rings, right? So now you know something about circuits that most people don't know, which is how they work at a fundamental level in terms of charge and field. And next time what we'll explore is the energetics, how it works, how the energy of circuits works out. <coughs>